Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Lemicki. I'm the Senior Director of Science and Industry Affairs at the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is on the drug product section of the aging case study. This is the fourth in the series of webinars on the aging case study. Uh, we will be, this is actually the last webinar uh, of the year for aging, but we will be resuming these again in January and have several more culminating in a half day workshop. Sorry, for those of you who aren't familiar with aging, aging was first conceived of at an ARM workshop focused on CMC issues in December of 2017. Uh, the project was completed in June of this year and now exists as an open source document on ARM's website. Aging, the case study aging describes the process for developing and manufacturing an AAV vector using a triple transfection process and an HEK 293 cell line, importantly using principles of quality by design. Quality by design is a systematic approach to development that begins with predefined objectives and emphasizes product and process understanding using sound science and quality risk management. As I said earlier, we are rolling out the aging project. The document itself is available to the entire field open source but initially we have a series of webinars uh, targeted for ARM members only. You can find more information about these on ARM's website on the events page at the link here. Uh, and you can find the document itself on ARM's website at the link on the bottom. With that, I would like to introduce the speaker for today and the primary content contributor for this section of aging. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Hung. Jeff has over 20 years of experience in the biotechnology industry. He is currently the general manager at Vigene Biosciences. He joined Vigene in 2016 and orchestrated the uh, acquisition of Omnia Biologics. He's an experienced entrepreneur and was instrumental in successfully growing GenScript and SA Biosciences, two previous companies, to IPO and acquisition stage, respectively. He also held the position of chief marketing officer at ATCC. Jeffrey is the author of multiple patents, publications, and book chapters. He holds a PhD in genetics from Cornell University, an MBA from UC Berkeley, and a BS in biology from Peking University. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Mike. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, uh, regardless where you are, welcome. It's uh, uh, my pleasure uh, to be the speaker today uh, presenting chapter seven, aging book, uh, AV product uh, characterization and the final field finish. First of all, I would like to um, thank ARM for initiating aging and a cell book. And I also applaud uh, Mike's leadership in organizing all the authors, reviewers for uh, both books. It's uh, really going to be a really good community asset and a good tool uh, for every gene therapy developer and manufacturer. So good job, Mike. Yeah, thank you also um, to Arm and Mike for the invitation to contribute uh, to this initiative. Yeah, thanks, Mike, for the kind introduction. Um, just. Um, a little bit more. So I'm also an author for the ACEL book on uh, lentivirus. Uh, so the, hopefully we will have another time to talk about the lentivirus. Uh, today's webinar will be uh, primarily focusing on AV, drug product and fill finish. So as Mike already alluded to, uh, the basic concept for aging book is to demystify uh, the AV production and fill finish and the characterization. The idea is really uh, with quality by design principle. And so essentially in layman's term, it's beginning with the end goal in sight. And in the context of today's webinar, um, the end goal for drug product of gene therapy encompass quite a few areas I will outline here. 
Um, so the first one is formulation and delivery device uh, compatibility, container closure, and the critical quality attributes and the stability. So we'll discuss those five areas um, in detail. Literally, we're going to take deep dive into this molecularly into this vial of final product of gene therapy. So this one uh, on this picture is approved Luxterna um, uh, drug uh, vial. And so we begin, we begin the webinar or the design of gene therapy with a successful end goal in sight. And the reason is the purpose of this webinar is really um, stage uh, all the manufacturer and the gene therapy developers for success in the very beginning, because um, as the, yeah, sorry about that. The, um, as the executive sponsor and the CMC uh, representative for over 20 IND gene therapy trials, I can say with uh, a lot of, uh, um, I would say a lot of experience and the, the pain seeing the gene therapy going through the manufacturing and the characterization only to realize that the design, both on the quality design and the process design or vial design or formulation design was not optimal. And when one realized that in the very end, it's kind of too late and wasted a lot of time and a lot of money. So I want everybody to have the end goal and success in mind when we start to design the gene therapy. So that's why I really identify with the initiative of AG and really identify with this uh, um, community efforts to demystify AV manufacturing and characterization so that we can make gene therapy accessible by many, many patients who are in need. So as uh, Mike already alluded to, the quality design essentially is a start, is basically to start a process with the end goal in mind. The end goal here is a gene therapy product can be approved, can be administered to patients without the rework, reprocessing, or redesign. So to achieve that goal, we need to have the product specification, quality, and the process design at the very beginning. The, so the, it will encompass quite a few areas, including formulation buffer, container closure, drug product volume, and tighter considerations, and number of vials to be filled for clinical trials and later on to, for a uh, commercial stage. Because all of this will impact how the prop manufacturing process is designed, how the, for instance, container closure is uh, uh, selected and the formulation buffer is designed. And the stability is of critical importance and for both clinical trials and the commercial supply. Because by and large, AV need to be stored in minus 80 and the storage temperature shipment requirements and the stability CQAs are all, some, are all the aspects one needs to consider before even start the process of manufacturing uh, the gene therapy product. So today I will touch upon four major areas of content. The first one is a field finish key considerations, specifically uh, formulation buffer. And then I will talk about the gene therapy delivery because the gene therapy administration route impact the formulation buffer and the final product titer and volume. And I will talk about the aseptic processing and the sterile fill finish and the, and the CCIT, um, container closure integrity testing. And then I will 
spent a good chunk of today's webinar on the specific test, namely safety, purity, identity, and potency. And, and then we'll finish with uh, some uh, summary. So without further ado, let's talk about formulation. So formulation buffer is one of the most important aspects of gene therapy. And is also one of the most neglected area when one starts to develop gene therapy. As a CMC partner for a lot of uh, um, gene therapy companies, oftentimes we found that people uh, the, doesn't put a lot of thought into formulation buffer. And then as a consequence, it uh, may impact, for instance, administration device not compatible, extractability not good, or administration route not supported. And so on this slide, also in the um, aging book, we discussed on the commercially approved formulation buffer, which has demonstrated, for instance, clinical administration compatibility and long-term stability. So on this slide, I listed two commercially approved formulation buffer. The first one is Zogenzima intravenous uh, injection. And if you look at the buffer here is a um, tris magnesium, uh, sodium chloride, and uh, uh, 188 uh, surfactant. And for Luxterna subretinal injection, it's uh, sodium chloride, sodium phosphate, and uh, 188 um, Plexmer uh, surfactant. And if you need to develop formulation uh, buffer for other purposes, those are the, this slide listed uh, uh, the four different areas of um, formulation development considerations. The first one, first and foremost, is the stability of the drug product. And uh, later on, we're going to um, talk about what are the stability assays one need to um, implement to interrogate the stability of gene therapy AV viral vectors. But one of them is aggregation of AV at higher concentration and over course of years. The second aspect one needs to um, consider when developed formulation is device compatibility. So some of the devices are needles and syringes, and some are, for instance, the bags for or different vials for cell therapy. And the third one is container closure and the extractability. Yeah, sorry about that. I think it has some timing of the previous recorded. And the fourth one is downstream application compatibility. And so I talk about the cell therapy compatibility is a major one because um, a lot of AV now is being utilized in cell therapy um, preparation, especially in the area of gene editing. And then how to make the formulation compatible with cell treatment uh, without uh, disrupting uh, the cell therapy workflow is also pretty key. So all those um, four aspects need to be taken care of when uh, one needs to develop a new formulation uh, buffers. And the, the aging and this webinar uh, talk about the, the commercially approved uh, formulation buffer, which is a good basis for a lot of uh, uh, studies. So that's, um, that's a really good uh, uh, news to the community and a good tool uh, to utilize. And one aspect of formulation buffer is to prevent the AV from aggregate, ag aggregating. And as you know, the AV has a, um, has a surface charge and uh, at, a, at a certain concentration or at a certain uh, electric charge environment, AV tend to aggregate. And different serotypes have different aggregation threshold. And for instance, uh, recombinant AV2 uh, tend to undergo aggregation in the much lower threshold than AV8 or nine. And this uh, different uh, level of aggregation threshold also impact the ability to administer uh, AV in certain dosage. 
And to change the aggregation uh, threshold, one can uh, use um, elevated ionic strength for formulations such that uh, the um, AV can stay um, in this uh, buffer without aggregating. Because when AV aggregate is oftentimes an irreversible uh, process that uh, renders AV um, almost like useless uh, for injecting. And the other um, important aspect for choosing a formulation buffer and a developed formulation buffer is about delivery device compatibility. So on this slide, I listed um, quite a few um, administrati administration routes uh, for AV, including intravenous as uh, the, as the um, zogenzima and intraocular. There are a lot of, uh, for instance, uh, ophthalmology drugs are being developed for that. And the subretinal Luxterna is subretinal um, administration route, intramuscular and the cell therapy. And the last one, the CNS is by far the probably the, um, the largest area for gene therapy um, development. Uh, so there's um, quite a few administration route Depicted here is uh, the cisternal, uh, the intracerebral uh, ventricular injection. And uh, there are also intraparenchymal uh, uh, um, injection and the lumbar intrathecal and the cisternal intrathecal injection uh, through the spine. And so all those uh, delivery um, routes will determine the formulation buffer uh, composition because it has a different tissue and the different space constraint for formulation buffer for the spread of AV into adjacent tissues. So the device delivery uh, device compatibility and the surgical um, procedures is very critical for the formulation buffer development. Now onto uh, container closure. So oftentimes when gene therapy developers start to think about container closure, it's a lot of times is afterthought, but we wanted to uh, fast forward uh, to the front when you consider uh, gene therapy development. So the compatibility um, and the acryl preservation compatibility are two aspects uh, you need to consider. The first one regarding the route of surgical administration is uh, um, a lot of times has to do extractability. So how the how the um, the syringes uh, extract and how much you can extract from the container, how easy it is to extract from the container, and how much can be. Uh, injected from the syringe and the needles and so forth, all need to be uh, characterized and uh, uh, analyzed in detail. And then uh, cryo preservation. So in minus 80, that's typical temperature um, the, for uh, AV um, long-term storage. And in that temperature, uh, a lot of times the stopper and the vial have a different uh, ratio of uh, uh, the condensed and being shrinking, uh, shrunk in size. So if the ratio of stopper and vial doesn't shrink uh, in this minus 80 extreme temperature, disproportionately, you can see there's going to be opening and gaps in the final drug product. So that's uh, not ideal and the uh, pose a significant uh, patient safety when the final uh, drug vial is not fully um, closed. So here I listed the two um, prevalent uh, polymer-based on the vials. One is a crystal xenons and the other one is a aseptic technology. And both FDA and uh, EMA and all other regulatory agencies will require the gene therapy developer to submit 
detailed uh, container closure integrity test, CCIT. And here I listed uh, a few methods uh, that uh, one can use. So electric conductivity and is one. Microbial ingress, USP 1207.1 is another one. And the gas-based and pressure decay. And also dye ingress is the USP 1207.2 uh, is also one. And the gas ingress, that's more on the, for instance, the, some um, the, those helium or uh, the, the dormant gas uh, ingress can also be used uh, for uh, container closure uh, integrity test. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to um, go to the last part, uh, which is a big chunk that I will go through. So there's the four aspects of the interrogation of characterization of final products, safety, integrity, potency, and the purity. So I will go through each one of the, uh, the list in detail and go through each test in detail. So safety test, safety is of paramount importance. One, when uh, gene therapy developers submit the IND ETCD package uh, to the agency. So there are primarily uh, six uh, different tests one needs to do. So on this um, slide, I listed the assays, purpose of assay and the time of assay or samples of assay need to be uh, analyzed for the uh, safety uh, reasons. So the first one, adventitious viral agents. So adventitious uh, viral agents um, basically represent the um, potentially harmful uh, viruses that uh, either uh, produced during the production process or in the cell line. So that they include the canine um, and the uh, human and porcine and all the, uh, the viruses that can potentially cause harm. So this panel of uh, adventitious viral agents is to interrogate uh, those uh, potentially harmful uh, agents. And so the time of assay is using the crude uh, cell harvest, or you can also call it the unpurified bulk to analyze. And the mycoplasma, as you know, is a, um, a kind of uh, microbe that um, primarily uh, infects the cell line and it can cause major issue. It's very hard to um, decontaminate from mycoplasma. So for all the, um, the cell therapy and the gene therapy, mycoplasma, um, the contamination is something to be really mindful and also the huge uh, source of endotoxin. So the, to demonstrate the absence of mycoplasma is also pretty key. The, um, the time of assay is during the unpurified bulk. So bell burden um, to ensure the aseptic conditions throughout the manufacturing process. As uh, many of you know, some of the currently um, quite a few steps in the um, AV manufacturing is open vessel. So it is important to interrogate um, the bell burden level uh, throughout the process. So this is uh, primarily using the uh, throughout the purification step and the throughout the manufacturing step to interrogate a different step to ensure the safety of the, um, the drug product. So, and the toxin, um, that's uh, a, a byproduct uh, that is secreted by the E. coli and other um, bacteria. And so it's uh, something really important to um, to interrogate, to ensure the safety to the patients. And so the endotoxin is primarily analyzed in the formulated and the vial, the final lots. And the sterility, sterility um, is to ensure that the final product, product is free from any pro, uh, microbe. So st st sterility um, using essentially quite a few different media to culture the potential contaminants within the drug products. 
So some media is to culture uh, fungi and the yeast. Some culture is to uh, culture the, some media means to culture the anaerobic, the E. coli. Some um, is to uh, culture the aerobic uh, E. coli. So that's a, a sterility test. And sterility test uh, oftentimes um, uh, consumes uh, the most number of vials because uh, uh, per USP 71, there's a lot of, uh, um, of either 10 or 10 vials or 10% uh, minimally need to be interrogated uh, in the, this assay. And last but not least, RCA1, RCAV stands for recombinant, uh, the re replication competent, competent AV. So the by and large, the gene therapy AV is recombinant AV, which rendered AV already incapable of replicating itself inside the cells or inside the humans. Um, but there is remote chance for the um, AV to adopt replication competency. So that pose uh, some risk to the um, to the patients and the, the, the individuals who receive uh, AV uh, therapy. And on the molecular side, it's a, RCAV can happen when the ITR is recombined uh, to flank the RAP protein. So that's um, the, something that uh, very rarely happened because the triple transfection is already um, minimize that risk, but in the very remote cases that can still happen. So RCAV is to um, prevent and also to interrogate the sample to prevent that uh, from being administered to patients. So purity test. Purity is very important uh, for ensuring the safety and the, the, um, of the gene therapy product. So in this one, we have about nine different assays. The first one is residual whole cell protein. As you know, AV cannot replicate itself inside the cell. So the, all the AV, recombinant AV has to be packaged uh, de novo inside this HAC293 cell. And the HEX293 cell is a kidney cell, um, tumor cell line. So it may potentially carry oncogene and oncoprotein. So therefore, residual whole cell protein uh, removal and whole residual whole cell DNA removal is very critical. And time of assay is at the purified bulk, uh, or you can call it drug substance uh, stage. And OD260 and 280 um, ratio uh, determines uh, essentially the um, DNA to protein uh, ratio. As you know, the AV is a capsid uh, that encapsulated uh, the, the single strand DNA. So it is computable what is a desired OD260-280 is should the AV is a completely 100% pure and 100% full uh, capsid. And so this one uh, is uh, critical to um, basically to see if there's any, for instance, protein contamination or DNA contamination. Um, and residual plasma DNA. Uh, so the entire aging book is on this um, manufacturing process hinged upon HEC293 triple transfection based uh, AV manufacturing. And plasmid is used as uh, um, intermediary material to package uh, AV capsid. And the majority of the plasmid uh, should have been either destroyed or packaged or um, replicated. So they will, should be absent from the final drug product and drug substance. But to ensure that we need to um, interrogate. One of the reason uh, is uh, Oftentimes the plasma has certain antibiotic uh, resistance uh, gene. So we need to make sure that is absent from the final drug product and drug substance. Residual BSA, 
uh, so that's bovine serum uh, albumin. That is a um, basically a surrogate uh, for um, fetal bovine serum. So if your manufacturing process does not include uh, FBS, this one can be omitted. A residual benzenase, the, so as I alluded to, during the manufacturing and purification process, benzenase, which is a DNA, is used to uh, chop down, for instance, the whole cell DNA or residual plasma DNA, but itself is also harmful. So the, to demonstrate the uh, removal, improve, complete the removal of benzenase, uh, benzenase is also critical. And then residual uh, substance from pur purification. And for instance, uh, cesium chloride, which is a, uh, a gradient uh, substance for ultra centrifugation. Uh, cesium is a heavy metal, which is toxic to humans. And so that one is critical to be removed. And uh, the eighth one, the aggregates, ensure aggregates at an acceptable level. And the AV aggregates um, the, is uh, not ideal because when AV uh, aggregates, it tend to precipitate out and no longer um, can no longer bind to the, um, the receptors on the, the target cells efficiently. So the, even though uh, the titer may represent something, but the, the truly um, the, the potent AV May, much re may be much reduced if there are uh, AV aggregates. Uh, lastly, uh, SDS page, silver stain. So as you know, the SDS uh, page is the method to separate the proteins and denature proteins and separate the proteins uh, based on the size. And silver stain is merely to visualize those um, um, protein bands and the, the on each AV, there are uh, four, uh, there are three different uh, capsid proteins encoded by one contig. So VP1, VP2, VP3. Those are just different isoforms of uh, the same um, nucleotide um, genetic code, but they do carry different function. And so VP1, VP2, VP3, they also have a certain ratio, one to one to 10 ratio. And so that's one just, uh, this silver stain is important to interrogate that part. Uh, identity test, uh, so capsid uh, identity. There are two kinds of, as, as we alluded to, uh, AV uh, has both capsid and also the payload inside. So ca capsid identity is often uh, revealed by ELISA or Western. And, and also um, the, uh, or silver stain. Uh, so this one is done uh, on both on purified bulk, both uh, purified bulk and formulated vial. And a lot of times the, uh, the full empty capsid is also uh, performed uh, as part of the identity. One of the reason being the uh, AV capsid can enclose without any uh, payload inside. So the AV can be formed, capsid can be formed independent of a, a payload loading. So the, as you can imagine, the empty capsid does not carry any functional um, gene therapy. So it poses no potency benefit. Instead, it actually poses a lot of uh, uh, the toxicity risk in that the, uh, the capsid can elicit inflammation and other immune response from the body. So the agency take great lengths to interrogate empty full capsid. Uh, second part of the uh, identity is payload identity. Uh, so as you know, the um, within AV capsid is a single strand uh, AV um, DNA um, with uh, a flanking uh, ITR. And payload and identity needs to be 100% matched with the um, desired sequences. So this one needs to be done on the unpurified bulk, purified bulk, and the formulated uh, drug product, and the vial the drug product. 
Okay, on to last one, which is also the most difficult one, uh, the gene therapy test, that is potency. So potency by its name, um, the, you can um, surmise that is regarding the AV's ability to do its job. And so to interrogate the potency, oftentimes it can be done either in cell or in vivo before it can be applied in vivo in humans. So the, so TCID50 is an in-cell assay. So they basically determine the concentration that uh, at which 50% of the cells are infected. So the, this one, um, you can read um, more on this. AV has a different uh, ability to infect cells. So oftentimes to um, normalize the baseline, one need to have a adenovirus as a helper virus to increase the sensitivity of the infect, infection or the, to yeah, increase the sensitivity of this assay. And, it, and it, uh, um, the end result will be interrogated by the qPCR. And the other way to interrogate the potency is protein expression, right? Or mRNA level. Oftentimes it's done in cells to ensure protein can be expressed post infection or tra uh, uh, transduction of AAV. So this one needs to be done on both the DS and the DP. And in some cases, in some rare cases, uh, the, if the in-cell assays cannot be easily developed, in vivo animal um, potency test can be also used to demonstrate the potency prior to administering uh, the, the drug into humans. So the appropriate dosing and the potency, this one is done on DP. Oftentimes it's for reference only because it's um, oftentimes it's very costly to do this kind of in vivo animal testing and uh, um, very rarely can this testing be um, quantitative. That's why it's um, oftentimes is uh, are, um, for information only. Okay, on to uh, one of the last topics, stability test. This is, is uh, by no means a, um, a standard. This is a recommendation uh, for a, for instance, a clinical trial of two years. And there are five assays that need to be um, analyzed, uh, implemented to interrogate the G gene therapy AV uh, throughout. So the five assays are aggregation, potency, identity, sterility, and the CCIT. And the time points typically is 0, 3, 6, 12, 8, 24 months. So we have talked about the, aggreg the aggregation um, and this uh, dynamic light scattering is an easy way to interrogate um, aggregation uh, at ease. Um, and potency protein expression TC or TCID50, you just need to do one. Identity, and you can, uh, or Titer, um, you can do uh, qPCR or DDPCR based titer, and sterility um, USB seventy one, and CCIT. Um, you can either do uh, yeah one of the uh, gas ingress or um, microbe ingress or other way of doing CCIT. All right, uh, so we are reaching the end of this webinar. Um, I hope uh, I have uh, give you a good enough picture for you to, uh, to understand what a good uh, gene therapy looks like. And when you design your gene therapy, you will have those things in mind, including formulation buffer, container closure, and stability of the drug product. And my recommendation, um, I hope all of you will succeed in your endeavor to uh, develop much needed uh, uh, gene therapy for unmet medical needs. And you, if you do that, um, please do start early with test and uh, start uh, um, design um, in the very beginning on all aspects of uh, 
the gene therapy, including purity, safety, identity, and the potency. Okay, uh, with that, I will uh, stop and I welcome um, any questions. Thank you, Jeff, for that, that excellent presentation. So I'll open it up to the audience now. If you uh, can use the Q&A tab, uh, we have some time for uh, questions. Maybe while we're giving people a few minutes to formulate those in their, their mind and type those in, I'll, I'll open up with one or two questions for you, Jeff. So you really uh, went into depth about all the extensive uh, testing that is required, including release testing for these products, uh, which consumes product, you know, particularly in the case of sterility testing, as you pointed out. Um, and you know, often you're dealing with uh, limitations in yield and, and very uh, fairly small batch sizes. So this can be a challenge. And are there best practices or can you describe any best practices for appropriately minimizing the need to consume uh, the, the final product uh, for release testing? Yeah, thank you, Mike, for raising the question. That's really the struggle for a lot of gene therapy developers because uh, the yield wasn't uh, great to start with and we have to allocate a lot of vials for release tests uh, before they can be administered to patients. I would uh, point out probably two areas um, to consider. Um, even though there's a lot of tests, uh, a lot of tests consume very little uh, sample. For instance, all the qPCR samples, it, you don't need a whole lot. So my recommendation is to pick a contract testing lab, which does not need one vial for each test. Instead, you can talk to them and they can receive one vial and perform, for instance, 10 different tests, for instance, residual DNA, residual plasmid, a titer, and all the qPCR, even ELISA base, you don't need a whole lot. So if your contract testing lab can accommodate that, that will really save a lot of sample, right? I mean, you consider if uh, one vial can supply 10 different tests instead of one vial per test, that's a huge difference. So I would um, definitely have that dialogue with your contract testing lab. The next one is uh, really um, the, something to discuss with uh, the agency. For some rare and ultra rare disease, um, the agency may have the uh, ability to relax uh, the USP 71 requirements because the USP 71 is a minimum 10 vials or 10%, whichever is, uh, is greater. So the, if for instance, if you, for some of the, um, high dose injections. If you can negotiate down to uh, lower than 10, let's save a lot of vials. Yeah, those are the two, uh, my uh, two lines of thinking. Yeah. Good, really uh, excellent suggestions. So we, we have had a, a few questions come in from the audience. Uh, the first one is, uh, is subvisible particle testing a requirement uh, for a release assay? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, particular matters definitely is a required assay. Subvisible um, oftentimes uh, refers to, or is a surrogate for um, AV aggregate, aggregation. So if you have DLS and a subvisible may not be um, that important. So um, I would definitely check with um, your QA and the RA uh, for their input. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Another uh, question from the audience is related to uh, your recommendations for uh, stability testing. And the question is, could you kindly confirm if for early clinical phase, sterility is required at each stability time point or if some could be skipped? Yeah, so, yeah, so that is a good question. So stability is really to support your clinical trial to ensure the potency, identity, safety, and the purity are maintained throughout the clinical trial period. So for instance, if you have only one year um, 
clinical trial enrollment, you don't need, um, for instance, uh, the time points post 12 months. Yeah. Okay, good, good clarification. Um, maybe it just a, there's a follow on to um, which level of assays, uh, validation, or qualification should we consider for the early clinical phase? So I think the, the question, if I understand it, maybe the questioner could clarify is, at the early clinical phase, do you need to validate these assays or is qualification uh, sufficient? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's, uh, for early, let's say phase one, two, I would recommend um, the minimally the tighter and empty full being fully qualified. So the either DTPCR, QPCR, that one needs to be um, qualified slash validated um, and then empty full um, because those two assays, uh, the agencies uh, care deeply about. Right. And maybe that just makes me think of a, actually a follow-on question about uh, characterization of empty and full capsids. So you, and you talked about some of the issues with empty capsids and the potential for immune response. You know, they could elicit an immune response, but don't really have a positive therapeutic effect. But is, is there also a potential for toxicities due to what's inside the capsids or, or, a, or a partially full capsid in particular? And uh, are there characterization methods that can be used uh, or what types of characterization methods can be used to sort of tease that, tease that out? Right. Yeah, that's a uh, hypothetical question. Um, there are, so the question is really regard um, the partially packaged uh, capsids uh, in which uh, potentially whole cell DNA and other foreign uh, DNAs are packaged. The method to, to integrate that uh, uh, by and large is NGS and to uh, have non-biased uh, um, sequencing uh, for all payload. Um, having said that, I think there are um, reports um, that uh, um, in AG, yeah, ASGCT meetings and other uh, for, forum that I have seen the, especially through uh, either the short read or long read NGS, uh, one can analyze uh, the, the foreign payload and the interpretation of those payload is, is really up to the reviewer. As you can imagine, there's a whole bunch of uh, the, the noise. And, and certainly there are um, quote unquote uh, risky genes, but whether they truly pose a uh, risk for the patients is really up to the uh, interpretation of the reviewer. A uh, question about container closure integrity testing from the audience. Uh, is it performed by a therapeutic developer with the final product or can the supplier's validation package be sufficient? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the CCIT uh, can be done in two ways. One is with drug product inside and one is without. Uh, for instance, for gas uh, in ingress, you don't need any drug product for those things, you probably can rely on the manufacturer provided uh, test report to demonstrate uh, the, the CCIT is sufficient. Um, that's really, uh, I think requires uh, the, for instance, your container closure. Um, the, for certain uh, container closure, um, that is sufficient uh, from manufacturer, but for certain um, container closure is not sufficient. Okay, and I think just we have time maybe for one more question here and then we're gonna actually ask a few questions of the audience. Uh, there's a question um, about safety assays. Don't all safety assays need to be fully validated? Uh, for example, sterility, uh, endotoxin and mycoplasma? Yeah, all those tests are compendio assays. They don't need to be validated because they are just following the USP protocol, you just make sure that your system is uh, 
basically system suitability need to be demonstrated. Okay, thanks for that uh, clarification. So uh, with that, I will uh, ask Nancy to bring up, we have two uh, poll questions for the audience. These are quiz questions. Uh, in both of these, you'll be looking for the best answer. So the, the first one is the main differences, emphasis on differences between fill and finish for gene therapy products compared to more traditional biologics include uh, A, smaller batch size, B, larger batch size, C, faster batch processing is required due to stability issues, D, aseptic processing is required, or A and C, uh, select the best answer. And the second poll question is about stability and, and what is the uh, storage temperature to maintain stability of AAV of the four options listed here. Again, best answer. So take a few moments to complete that and then uh, we will put the results uh, up on the screen. We have those uh, results in yet, Jancy? All right, so question one, uh, looks like the majority, 83% selected the correct answer, uh, A and C. So uh, no, no, one was, no one was fooled by the, uh, by the trick questions there. Um, and scrolling down here, also for, uh, Question two, the majority of the audience, in this case, 91% got the correct answer. Minus 80 degrees centigrade is the appropriate uh, storage temperature for maintaining stability of A and B. So good job. Um, thank you all for uh, joining today and thanks for the great questions. And uh, look forward again, we will uh, start, we will reinstitute these webinars in January of next year. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be posted on ARMS member portal. If you don't have access to that, uh, reach out to me directly or Tommy Zabo, our committee's administrator. And uh, you can also check ARMS website for registration information on future webinars. Uh, thanks again, Jeff. Okay, thanks everyone for thank joining you, us. everybody for your time. Okay. Good day. Bye -bye.